So hi, everybody. Uh, this is Angela Stanton, and I'm really honored to be able to present to you today and have a little discussion afterwards. And I'm going to be talking to you about migraine. Uh, as Tracy said, I'm a lifelong migrainer, or used to be, I need to say that, because since my own protocol, I don't have any. So let's talk about uh, what the protocol is. And I'm going to start with um, the agenda. So I would like to define migraine because there's so much confusion about what actually migraine is. Then I'm going to talk about a headache versus a migraine, which is an even bigger confusion out there as they're not very well defined. And then I'm going to discuss prodromes. Prodromes uh, are something that always must, that's mandatory to have with a migraine. And if you don't have one, then it's not a migraine that you're having. And then what your symptoms may be. And then of course, how to prevent a migraine. That is the main focus. And so, okay, so what is a migraine? So first of all, um, I have to right away say migraine is not a headache because people can have a migraine without any headache. And of course, people can have headache without having a migraine. So there's no connection between migraine and headache. It is, of course, many migraines do come with a headache, but the headache doesn't define a migraine. So what is a migraine? Migraine is a genetic difference in the brain. I'm not even going to call it a disease or a condition because once you understand what I'm talking about, you're going to see that it really isn't. It's just a different brain. And um, the difference is in the anatomy of the brain. So the migraine brain itself has, um, of course, we all have sensory neurons. So we have the nose, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, and the mouth, and, and of course, our skin. These are all of our sensory organs, and they're all connected to uh, neurons in the brain that are specific to each of these locations. And in the migraine brain, there are more of these neuron connections, not the neurons necessarily themselves, but to how many other neurons they connect. And in the neuron, in the brain, what matters really is how many connections neurons have, because the more connections the, brains have, the brain has, or particular neurons have, then there's going to be the more information exchange, which I will refer to as chatter. So the more chatter is in the brain, uh, say between the sensory neurons associated with the eyes, then of course, a little bit of a light is going to appear to be a bigger light than what it is because there's more chatter around it. And a little bit of an order is going to be a bigger order. So everything is going to be amplified. So this is the cause of migraine and it is made worse by the genetic modifications of this brain, that not only does it have more sensory and neuronal connections, but it also has changes in the ionic channels. So what are the ionic channels? In order for the brain to create an electricity, which is the voltage current that moves through the neurons from one neuron to the next to deliver the messages, um, it has to generate a voltage current. It's not like you can plug it into the wall for electricity in the brain the electricity is created by the brain. It's an organic electricity. This is very different from what you're familiar with. And this is created by sodium entering the cell and potassium leaving the cell. And this movement itself generates what is called the action potential. And unfortunately, the very channels that allow the sodium to come in, the potassium to go in, the calcium to move and release the neurotransmitters for the extra cheddar, these channels are all variants in the migraine brain. This doesn't mean that they're better or worse. It just means they're different from the brain of other people. And so when people have problems or differences with their ionic channels, that is referred to as channelopathy. So migraine is a form of channelopathy, but it is a genetic condition. And not also, uh, I wrote carbohydrate intolerance. And that's because given how much cheddar is happening in the brain, the brain needs a lot of sodium to start the electricity in the brain, the action potential. But when you eat any carbohydrate, as glucose enters the cells, it removes sodium and water from the cells. So the very thing, sodium, that you would need to start an action potential is removed by the carbohydrates. And because of the channelopathy, 
the more carbohydrates you eat, the worse the situation gets. And you're basically creating an electrolyte imbalance, which is the cause of migraine. And it's electrolyte imbalance with the genetic variants of the brain is more difficult to re reset. So this is basically the most important part of migraine. And when we are talking about uh, migraine, even if a migraine doesn't come with a headache per se, the same background story is happening. It is still about the sodium and the potassium and the voltage-gated ionic channels, and it is still about the carbohydrates. The difference is a very complicated process that I don't want to get into detail in this short time that I have to, to discuss, but there is one particular step uh, that the brain is doing, which is referred to as a cortical spreading depression, which you can envision as if there was like a little person standing in one part of the brain and it would release a large dose of sodium, sending the whole brain through what is referred to as depolarization, meaning sodium is going to be entering all through every single cell neuron as it's moving through. It's like a wave. Think of it as an ocean wave. As somebody just dropped uh, a drop of water in it, but it rather than going in a circular fashion, it's going in one direction. And so those who have the aura, for example, see this wave, which activates every single neuron as light of different colors or spots and sparkles or whatever aura they may see. And so when you're looking at, for example, not having a headache, that's because that particular cortical spreading depression, this big wave was able to reestablish the sodium imbalance to be a sodium balance. So the electrolyte is returned to a homeostasis, a balance. And at that point, there will not be pain. But the process of the cortical spreading depression is visible by this movement of the current and how uh, every single neuron is touched by those who see aura. And the people who see this particular cortical spreading depression as aura, they only see it because it is happening in the occipital cortex, which is the visual part of the brain, okay? And so um, there isn't difference really much between an aura migraine and a non-aura migraine. I know there's a lot of information out there suggesting big differences. There's more uh, stroke potential for people who have aura. In fact, an editorial that I was asked to write in the American Journal of um, American uh, Journal of the American Colli College of Cardiology is going to come out in a couple of weeks where I'm discussing this very thing, how this is misunderstood, and therefore a lot of research articles are completely incorrect. And so all migraines are the same. It doesn't matter if it's hemiplegic, trigeminal, whatever kind of migraine it is, they're all the same. Uh, the difference is, is the location within the brain. In terms of the location, we have two separate hemispheres in the brain and they don't have the same functions. Like if you're right with your right hand, the function to, for that is in the left side of your brain. The right side of the brain will have a function to write with your left hand. So the brain itself is two completely different hemispheres. And there are some symmetries, such as, for example, in the, the writing or hearing or seeing, but there are others, for example, speech which is exclusively on the left side. So if you end up with a migraine exactly in the left side, in the location where uh, the speech center is, then you may not be able to talk. And so um, the migraine is always unilateral, meaning it's on one side, only one side. If it's you have a headache that is on two sides, that's not a migraine. The pain must be minimum four hours. So if you have a pain that is just three hours, no matter how bad it is, that's not classified as migraine. Now, whether these make sense or they don't make sense, it's another question, but this is the official definition of migraine. And pain in the migraine, that this one is a little bit different because it's defined in different ways depending upon where you read it. But given that migraine is an electrolyte induced problem and not a vascular headache, it doesn't throb and it doesn't have any positional factors. So if you have a headache and you bend forward, or lie down, the headache itself may change. In the case of migraine, it doesn't matter what you do, the pain won't change. So it's not positional. And so uh, in this slide, I'm trying to compare, 
a headache versus a migraine in some perspective so that you can understand some of the differences. So first of all, headache, anyone can have a headache. But migraine is genetic, right? So you need to have a very specific brain to have a migraine. Um, OTC over counter medications, any simple painkillers may work for a regular headache, but they usually don't work for migraine at all because migraine is an electrolyte problem, not a vascular problem. Most headaches are just vascular. Uh, a simple headache can be caused by anything. It could be stress, it could be a cold, it could be whatever else. A migraine is always caused by an electrolyte imbalance, nothing else. That's the only thing. Whatever may cause an electrolyte imbalance can cause a migraine. Um, a standard headache is affected by position changes, as I mentioned earlier, migraine isn't. Uh, a standard headache can last for a long, short, however length of time. Migraine has to be over four hours. Migraine always has a prodrome. A prodrome is something that happens before the migraine, sort of kind of tell you that you're about to come down with it. And what those are is going to come up in the next slide. In a standard headache, you don't have any prodrome. Postdrome is a state of feeling sort of kind of a hangover the day after a migraine. You don't get that from after a headache, but you definitely do from a migraine. Um, for a standard headache, you may get GI symptoms if the headache was caused by stomach problems or intestinal issues, but generally speaking, they don't always come with GI issues, but a migraine is nearly without exception coming with some sort of GI issues, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, maybe, um, um, uh, there could be uh, pain, IV, irritable bowel syndrome, etc. Um, in the case of a standard headache, yes, many people are sensitive to light, sound, and odor. But in the case of migraine, they're always sensitive to it. And in the case of a headache, it can be anywhere in the head. But in the case of migraine, as I noted, one side always, never both sides. And the, the pain doesn't move. So what is a prodrome? A prodrome is something that when your body feels that you're starting to be out of electrolyte imbalance and it initiates all kinds of symptoms for you that know that, hey, I'm out of electrolyte imbalance, do something. So when you feel a prodrome, um, which can start from uh, as early as 10 minutes, sometimes even earlier, maybe one minute, sometimes it can happen if you really pay attention, up to two days before a migraine, you may have some prodromes. And some of the prodromes are, of course, aura. Everybody knows that an aura is a migraine program, but there are hundreds of more programs. For example, most people don't know that migraineurs have one eye that will become smaller, not the eyeball, the whole eye. It will become like the person can't open the eye totally, like sort of kind of totis like this. And that will be uh, a migraine program. Uh, dizziness, uh, vertigo, a sugar crash is very common. Uh, Non-stop urination, because the excess urination is a sign that you're out of electrolyte balance and your kidneys are trying to balance your electrolytes. Uh, there may be tingling limbs, for example, in the case of hemiplegic migraines, sensitivity to light, sounds, and odors. And of course, the nausea, vomiting, dizziness, uh, maybe even vertigo, these all start very early. The actual symptoms, of course, it may or may not, may not come with strong pain. The nausea and vomiting is nearly uh, globally for all of them, at least a nausea comes with a migraine. And of course the intolerance of um, any kind of sound, light, odors, particularly food aversion, you can't eat while you have migraine, even though you may be craving uh, some salty or sweet stuff, you can't actually eat. Um, oftentimes a migraineer can't talk at all. Uh, we mentioned earlier, if the speech center is involved, then you can't talk. Uh, if the comprehension center is affected, then you can't comprehend, can't understand what others are saying. You may get disoriented, forget where you are, forget where you're going, um, may lose your sight completely in one eye. That can also happen or just partial. And of course, if you have hemiplegic migraines, you may lose your whole side, uh, including your legs and, and arm. It can also be just on one side, but it can affect a very broad range of symptoms. You can literally pass out. Uh, from them. So I included here a little video. I don't know if this is going to work. It didn't work. Um, let me go back. So this little video, I don't know if I can upload uh, and show my screen. Let me just get to that slide and see if I can um, share 
No, I can't share from here either. Let me see if I can. If you if you want to uh, go into the YouTube link, Angela, you can do the yeah. share screen and then I can put it in. Right. So, oops, let me just stop. Oh, hold on. Let me get the here. And, okay, so I opened this video. So how do I how do I share it? And then go down, back down to see where it says present and click on uh, share screen. Okay, hold on. I have too many windows open here. <laughs> yeah, just the one. I can't find you. Where are you? That's amazing. I can't find you anywhere. Yeah, you can't see the. I, I can't. Hold on. Let me let me just see. Where are you? I I totally lost you. How is that me possible? Me or the YouTube video? No, I lost you. Yeah. Oh, well, we can yeah. see you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Maybe you're on. Oh no, you're on the same. Okay, it's a two thing on the same thing. Okay, there you go. So now, how do I do yeah. that? So now, so I'll down where it says present, click okay. on present, and then there's a share screen option. Uh, share screen. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And then let me go share screen, and then yeah. let me go. Oh, what is entire screen? I'm just going to go share entire uh, reporter. Okay, this one I wanted to share. Okay, gotcha. There you so go. Did, see it? Okay, so I'm going to start. Yeah, and then I'll add that to the, to the stream. Okay, is it yeah. on the screen? Yep. Okay, let me start. CBS 2 Serene Branson is live at the Staples Center with highlights and backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time. Serene. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darrison. All right, let's go hit Paris Space and look for the bit. They have the bit. There. That, <laughs> that was it. Okay. I wanted to share this. All right. Let me just put in your presentation back and then I'll pop back <laughs> out. Okay. So I hope that everybody could to watch that video. So that was a typical migrainer. Okay. And so that was a, a person who, let me go back to the previous slide to show. So this was a person who had uh, the speech orient, uh, the speech center oriented and uh, could not actually, uh, could not, uh, she was slurring, couldn't speak, couldn't talk. And so they thought she had a stroke, but she only had a migraine, just only a migraine, okay? And so as you can see, migraine is really not just a headache. It can be very serious. And um, there are lots of medications out there, but I have to say that I've tried just about every single medication that was out there. And of course, I quit taking medications long before the latest uh, family of the CGRP inhibitors came out, luckily, which are really bad and uh, they do a lot of damage. And so I had the incentive to, to change my life around and to have um, to learn what it was an experiment to see what worked to, first of all, to abort a migraine if I had a migraine and then to, to figure out what would I have to do to prevent my migraines for life. And so this took me about 15 years to develop. And today, uh, up to, till today, we have over 20,000 people who have been healed by this and are, but they keep in touch with me. They may not be in my Facebook group or may not be personally uh, otherwise friends, but uh, every now and then they still keep in touch and they all are migraine free. And so what did I do? So knowing that it's a migraine is basically an electrolyte imbalance and knowing that carbohydrates cause an electrolyte imbalance and not just carbohydrates, and I will talk about a little bit about stress as well, but it is most important to look at what we eat because what we eat is how our body works. And so when we eat a lot of sugar, or we eat a lot of carbohydrates, and it may be perfectly what is considered to be healthy plant foods, uh, like for example, a lot of grains, or you you drink orange juice. This is a, these are all considered to be healthy foods, right? But they aren't, because um, just as an example for you, a single slice of sourdough bread, sourdough is really sour. Um, that is claim to fame. And people think it's really good for them because it's, of course, it's sour as a result of the fermentation of, of the, the bacteria that they, they, or yeast that they use for it. And uh, it's not sweet. So they think, well, it must be really good for me. But actually, a single slice 
say 100 gram, normally a slice is bigger than 100 gram, but a 100 gram slice of sourdough bread may have as much as 15 to 20 teaspoons of sugar equivalent in starches. And the thing is sour, it doesn't even taste sweet. So you can't tell just how much uh, starch and sugar basically you're eating. So it is very difficult to, to understand what you're eating and how it may cause damage to you. But once you test every single one of them, and I recommend you visit the USDA database, and I understand that in all over the country, all over the world, um, certain foods will have different kind of properties. And so we are not doing rocket science. We're not trying to launch anything to the moon. And so the absolute precision doesn't matter. So if on your end, a slice of sourdough bread has 15 teaspoons of sugar and somebody else we have 18 it really doesn't make a difference if it's more than a half a teaspoon of sugar you're already in trouble and so um basically whatever foods that you eat i recommend that you look at the usda database and look for the generic food items so you can find out well how much starch really is in a standard everyday bread how much starch is really in the standard uh whatever measure you use a cup a half a cup a gram or three and a hundred gram is three and a half ounces of legumes for example beans or peas or have an apple or anything like that just check the amount of carbohydrates and you're going to see surprisingly just how much we think we're not eating sugar, but we're eating sugar. And there is um, one particular person who created a YouTube video, um, Dr. Salcido. She um, has discovered, created a video showing that the standard person who doesn't even eat cereal or, or bad grains, just a standard American diet, no cakes, nothing really. I think that the person just ate, drank one cup of coffee a day with a little bit of sugar. But otherwise, there was nothing else had added sugar. Still, the total carbohydrate value of what she ate for that day was over 100 teaspoons of sugar equivalent. And that was when she cooked her own food and was whole foods, but still contained a lot of carbohydrates. So you need to make sure that you understand what you're eating and because migraine is carbohydrate sensitive and all migraineurs are extremely metabolically sensitive and in the past nine years that i have my facebook migraine group alive and people are coming in and we run tests to see their metabolic health i would say that 99 percent of them have metabolic uh, disease but they've just been undiagnosed and so it is essential that you stop eating basically all carbs that you can think of. Um, I particularly recommend even to go against those healthy green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables because they're very high in anti-nutrients. And if you have autoimmune diseases, which most people today do, Hashimoto's, um, or any arthritis, psoriasis, you name it, if you have it, um, any kind of autoimmune disease, you really shouldn't be eating any vegetables at all. Fruits, maybe, because fruits, the plant want us to eat their fruits so that we can disperse their seeds. But they most certainly don't want us to eat their flowers, their leaves, their stem, and their roots. And so you have to be careful because those are, and the seeds particularly, um, so any kind of seeds, nuts and seeds, they're very, very protected. And yes, you can cook some of these to the point that the anti-nutrients are re reduced significantly. They never disappear, but they reduce. But then you're still ending up with huge amount of starch. And so there's a problem there. Um, you need to also focus on what you can eat, of course. And so if you're stopping all your uh, carbohydrates and all your plant-based foods, now animal products are not without carbohydrate, but the amount of carbohydrate in, in meat or animal products is less and is used differently because the carbohydrates in meat are in a glycogen format and they're connected to protein. And so it's a little bit uh, used differently by your body. And so whatever, animal products that you choose to eat, including milk, um, 
it will come with carbohydrates, but the carbohydrates within these will behave differently. And so they're safer. They're still not safe. So you don't want to have like two gallons of milk all day long because then you're having a lot of carbohydrates and that is going to be in excess. But you just want to make sure that you're within what you consider to be your normal range. And for a migraine sufferer, that range is five grams of carbohydrate typically before they start causing an electrolyte imbalance. So you want to be careful how you do and what you do. And in addition to, of course, in dairy, I wrote here to look for A2 because a lot of people tell me that they're suffering from lactose intolerance and they can't have dairy. But what actually happens is they aren't really lactose intolerant. Only people, children who can't even nurse from their mothers, they are lactose intolerant. If you could nurse when you were a baby, you're not lactose intolerant. You may not have lactase enzyme active at the moment, but you can retrain your body. But the problem is usually the protein. Most cows today are overproducing milk. And so there is an, a variant of the milk protein. The normal healthy milk protein is the A2 protein, but in the variants, there's an A1 protein. So most of the milk that you can buy just in a regular everyday store is going to contain A1 slash A2. So both proteins will be in there, but in uh, particularly Australia, New Zealand, and now in the United States, you can get uh, A2 brand milk and in other brands as well, just A2 brand milk or protein milk. And then another important thing is that, as I noted, that glucose, uh, whenever you eat carbohydrates, it removes salt from uh, sodium from your um, cells. You can replenish this by adding more salt to your water. Don't add it to the food, because when you're eating the food, it's going to the salt is going to end up in a different place. It's going to end up inside your cells, and that's not where you want it. You want the salt in your blood, which then goes to the brain and replenishes the brain with, with uh, the proper amount of salt. So you want to add one eighth of a teaspoon salt to each eight ounces of cup, cups of water. Um, I think it's uh, 235 milliliters or something like this in, in metric. And so, and in the food, you really want to keep your balance, sodium to potassium to one to one as much as you can uh, to maintain the proper balance. And so if you feel that you have a prodrome, or you discover that you have a, a prodrome, um, or you started already having a pain, you can do uh, that I, I de devised uh, in 2014, but I call the salt test. And since then, I've seen many variations of the salt test by many people who took this, but without any understanding. And so there's a lot of misinformation about that. So the salt test is actually taking a tiny bit. I'm just talking about a few tiny salt crystals, not talking about big crystals, so very tiny uh, standard table salt crystals. Just put it under your tongue and don't talk, don't drink, don't swallow, nothing. The salt is going to melt under your tongue is your sal saliva glands and it's gonna release saliva and it's going to soak the salt up. And because it's sodium it's, and chloride, it's going to so uh, soak up without you having to swallow, it's going to go straight into your blood and it's going to go into your brain. And so within five, 10 minutes, you should be able to feel that you either reduce your prodrome or you made it worse. If you reduce the prodrome, that means you need to take more salt. And uh, how you take salt is on the next slide. And if the prodrome got worse, then you want to actually stop the salt and include potassium. But you don't take potassium as a supplement because then is going to end up in your blood. You don't want the potassium in your blood. You want the potassium inside your cells. So there's a difference. If you even look at your blood test and you're going to look at electrolytes, for example, you're going to see that in your electrolyte panel, there is a little bit of potassium. It's like four um, milli equivalent per liter. But at the same, <clears throat> in the same blood test, the sodium, <clears throat> excuse me, the sodium is going to be 135 to 145. So 140 is the average. So from four to 140, so 35 times as much sodium in your blood than potassium, but in the cells, it's the other way around. And so when you want more potassium, you want to eat the potassium in food. And when you need more salt, you want to take that in water. So there's a big difference there. And so <clears throat> whether you take the salt when you have a prodrome and say you suddenly feel better after you took the salt test, then you have to know what you ate before. Because if you ate a lot of carbohydrates before and you 
now know that the carbohydrates entering the cell, they remove sodium and water from the cell. When you drink more water, it's just gonna remove more. You don't want then to end up with edema. So then you just take the salt on its own, just take maybe a sip. But otherwise, um, if you didn't have carbs, then you can have the salt with water. Uh, you may have menstrual migraines, it's very common. You can have it twice a month with menstruation as well as ovulation time. Get on a scale and measure to see if you increased in weight or decreased. If you increased in weight at least two pounds or one kilo or more overnight for no reason, so check the morning uh, empty when you're on empty weight. If you in your weight increased by about a kilo or two or more than two pounds, then that means you retained salt. That means you're estrogen dominant. So at that time, you want to reduce the salt in your diet and increase the potassium in your diet. But if you lost weight, then you want to reduce the potassium in your diet and increase salt and water so to, to be hydrated. And for pressure drop, I recommend that you check wonderground.com, which gives you a 10-day forecast. If the pressure increases, then that means it's like you're going underwater, right? That means the pressure is really increasing on you, constricting your blood vessels. So you, at that time, you want to reduce the salt and water because you want the blood volume to be lower and you want to increase potassium in your meals. And if your pressure is dropping, it's like you went up to the Himalayan, then you want to increase salt and water so that your blood volume increases. And never ever take potassium supplement on its own because it, it takes forever to get it out of the blood. It's very difficult to do. I wrote an article on that as well, which you can find uh, at hormonesmatter.com, which I don't think I included. But um, please don't take potassium because you will be getting very sick from it. And I think I have finished everything that I could. So if you have any questions, this is the time. Yay. Let me just, can I just move that so we can talk? Um, firstly, thank you very much for um for sharing that it's so complicated like every time i listen to you i'm just like oh i'm so glad i'm not a migraine sufferer i can't even imagine you said it 15 years it took you to navigate all of this it's it took me forever because there are so many um possibilities and actually you know the biggest problem was is that to look through the migraine literature that was completely useless because all they're doing is medications and they're treating the symptoms mm -hmm. rather than looking at what the underlying causes. They know the cause because the medications that they're working on, there are many of them go after the ionic channels. So they know it's an ionic channel issue. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of literature on that, but then they're not addressing it without medication in a normal way. So I had to go into physics, chemistry, uh, even mathematics. I mean, I went through literature that you wouldn't think just to understand how the electricity works in the brain and how it may be connected to that it's just it was very very complex it took me over 15 years wow wow i just am wondering if there's anyone listening who is a migraine sufferer just let us know if you are because i think this um you know what you talk about angela is quite unique i mean as you said most people just try and manage it with medication and don't get anywhere um and i want to just i've got a couple of questions that i want to <clears throat> ask you about so the genetic, you mentioned this, so there is a genetic predisposition or it, there has to be a genetic. Right. Is, is it a, um, a gen? Is it a gen? Okay. Um, so when, is there a time, an, like an age when that would typically um, show up? Like if you That's a very good thinking? question. It's a very good question. And I have a very complicated answer for you. So oh. we now <laughs> know on some of the literature shows that a baby, an infant with colic, is a migraine. Oh, that's interesting. But of course, at that age, the, the infant itself can't tell you what's happening. So there's a colicky story there. Uh, I see children, of course, I started migraine when I was 10, 11, something like that. Mm -hmm. And But it wasn't like a migraine pain. I mean, I don't recall having a headache with it. I may have had a headache with it, I have no idea. But I recall being very sick, intestinal sick. So irritable bowel syndrome, cyclical vomiting syndrome, these are the symptoms of children with a migraine. And so it seems that there's an age variant of how migraine presents. So children typically don't present with the usual headache. They will present, they may pass out. We had a, a, a mother who showed a child just simply passed out. 
and then came to and couldn't was disoriented. There could also be seizures associated with migraine. I mean, there's just a lot of different things that can happen with migraine. I mean, you may not know that it's a migraine, but it's sort of kind of age dependently changing. And also age dependently, it may disappear. Like for boys, it's very typical to have migraine uh, until they get to their puberty. And then at that time it disappears. And for girls, it sort of kind of, they may have it from childhood, but if they didn't, then it starts to be stronger mm -hmm. at puberty. Yeah. And then like, for example, my first real migraine that, that came into pain that was actually diagnosed as migraine was after the birth of my second child. And I was 29. Wow. And so wow. there may be, and for many, we have many people's coming, many people's people come into the migraine group on Facebook who didn't have migraine until age 70, 60. We have some, you know, it, it can be any time because as genetics, it will have to express. And so when it expresses, it is dependent upon the epigenetics, the environment. And so, yeah. for example, we have several people who had, for example, act car accidents and a traumatic, traumatic brain injury Christ. initiated, mm. activated and expressed their migraine brain. And so even if they never had anybody in the family, they completely have migraines with the proper symptoms and prodrome and everything with as a result of the traumatic brain injury from a car accident or skiing accident or whatever else, um, because it suddenly turned on some genes that were not expressed before. So it can happen anytime. Wow. Wow. So it, it sounds like too, you know, like it's like a lot of things like with the even with like autoimmune, you know, that stressor, some stressor, like teenager, you know, going right. through puberties, a, a childbirth, car accident, these things tend to be stressors. So that uh, right. is, yeah, that's very, very interesting. And, and you know, it's, it's one more thing that is important here because I mentioned stress that I was going to talk about and I was hoping that you would come to it with a question. And this is where it connects because when you look at stress, what does stress actually do in our body? So assume for a second that you're back in ancestral human. I believe that the ancestral brain, the ancestral human brain, when we still lived not in houses and no protection, no light, and we were still very much um, open to being killed by a predator. At that time, the migraine brain with this, all this hypersensitivity organs, sensitive organs was probably the norm. That was a default because in order for you to survive, you had to hear good. You had to see good. You had to taste and smell. And so uh, migraineurs, for example, see in the dark much better than other people do. I mean, I am literally reading in the dark and my husband always comes and turns the lights on. I said, don't turn this on. I'm totally fine because for him it's dark. For me, it's totally fine. And wow. so we have different sensory organs, but if you go and look at, uh, go to safari, go to zoo and look at the animals, you will see that all animals will have their ears are going to be moving. They're going to be hearing, picking up noises that may be two, three miles away. I can hear uh, from very far, the faintest of noises. And so it was really funny because just the other day I was coming on the freeway and I heard the fire engine. You couldn't see them anywhere, not near anywhere. Everybody was just going. And I pulled to the side of the road and the people were like, why are you pulling? Well, I hear the fire engine. And so I knew it was coming. And it took over a minute for a fire engine to get there. But I heard it from that far. And so I moved aside to, to let it go. But other people won't hear it. And I will smell a car on fire five miles from me you know, on the freeway. So it's, it's, it's really interesting how strong uh, sensory organs migraineurs have. And this has an evolutionarily very important role, right? I mean, if you want to know about that lion five miles from me, not when it's hitting at you. And so I think that what's happening is that the migraine brain was, and I call it migraine brain, at that time you didn't have migraine because you had mm -hmm. to pay attention to these. And then when you had a lion, literally, five miles from you and you could see or smell that that lion is five miles from you and you could start the fight or flight. You could then run away or if the lion was closer, you could fight. And so you got rid of the stress hormones that would kick in because all the adrenaline kicks in as part of the stress hormone. And what does the adrenaline do? It releases 20 times as much glycogen as you normally would. So if your glycogen normally releases just one carb gram of glucose into your body to to feed the red blood cells, the only ones that actually need glucose, then in a case of fight or flight, you're getting 20 grams. 
So yeah. that is a huge amount of glucose. It's like eating a slice of cake. And so that would, if you're not running, if you're not fighting, that is going to cause a migraine today in a migraineur. But if that migraineur, after eating a cake, goes off to boxing, for example, there may not be a migraine because that person used up, I mean, eating a cake is not the same as having a fight or flight, but so you you know what I'm trying to say, because the amount mm. of sugar that hits the body is about the same. And mm. so uh, if you have a fight or flight, and if you have stress, then exercise is a way. And, and if you exercise is a way, it's not going to cause a migraine. So many times, for example, my migraineurs will have stress, somebody died, um, I will tell them to exercise, go for a walk, go for a, a run, do something because it's going to reduce your stress. It's going to put your body to the movement that it assumes you're going through when you're going through stress. That's fascinating. So if you, exactly as you say, evolutionary, those people most likely survived, then had babies. So there's no, it's not surprising then there's so many of people that right. suffer from this. Exactly. And it's getting more and more because if you're looking at what's happening today, we have a lot of noise, we have a lot of people, yeah. we have a lot of light, we yeah. have a lot of carbohydrates, we have all the things that mm. overstimulate a brain a lot of that stress. is hypersensitive so, and a lot of stress as well. And so if you're combining all these and today is a nightmare for a migraineur, and actually the number of migraineurs is not increasing as I can see because of the new lifestyle that they're pushing the veganism and vegetarian diet base on a lot of people so i am seeing an increase in the number of people from the nordic scandinavian countries where they enforce the vegetarian diet very strongly on just about yeah. everyone i mean they can barely buy meat it's ridiculous it's really it's very yeah uh, i have Ooh. a lot of people there and of uh, in my group from that country they like tripled in the past year and they're complaining that uh, they're so discouraged that the prices are for meat, like three times of what it is, and they're not able to buy the local meat. They're buying meat imported from China and wherever else. And so they have, and in some of these countries, children can't take uh, meat for their snacks. Like real small children who take their lunches to school, they aren't allowed to take meat in their sandwiches. I actually can't believe that's actually i know that's where we're all heading i know that's what they're trying to right. to push um and it's slowly you know changing here too but i cannot believe that's actually happening now so which countries mm -hmm. in Nordic it's all countries? the all the scandinavian countries so we're talking sweden uh netherland norway uh denmark these are all and also it's increasing now in germany most of these countries, even uh, uh, I'm getting Switzerland. I mean, it's ridiculous how many countries are now starting to have migraineurs that are joining the migraine. And of course, the UK is my, yeah. one of my biggest group, and Australia is, is a, one of one of the biggest group as well. <clears throat> so uh, we have a lot of people from all over the world. But clearly, and there's Finn. Oh, a lot of Finnish people are coming in. So clearly, in Finland too, there's a huge enforcement of the vegetarian diet. Oh, it's so scary. It's what scares me so much about where we're heading. Um, so there is a question that's come up, and then I've got a couple more as well. But um, having to wear N95 masks at work all the time, I've had a problem with increasing migraines. Have you come across this with others wearing the masks? Well, a lot of people wear a mask and nobody had migraine from it because a mask itself doesn't cause migraine. Now, if it doesn't cause an electrolyte imbalance. Now, mm -hmm. if the person freaks out, as a result of anxiety behind a migraine, uh, behind a mask, that's a different story. Then you will get a migraine as a result of the anxiety that the mask may have caused. But um, otherwise, it, it, there's no connection. It's just a lot of people felt uncomfortable, and I guess discomfort can cause anxiety-like yeah. uh, behavior, and then that would release stress hormone. Yeah, that makes total that makes total sense. Um, so one of the things I'd like to questions I'd like to ask you is. Um, what do you see as the biggest differences to the standard low carb advice? So this is, you know, glaringly, what, what are the obvious differences you see for people, you know, when they give advice on eating low carb that may not work for someone with a migraine who has migraines? Well, of course, by now, most every nutritionists are against sugar. So I'm not really concerned about the sugar part, but 
sweeteners that are not non uh, zero calorie sweeteners. They are really bad for migraineurs because migraineurs have such a sensitive meta metabolic system that uh, when they take sweetener, it spikes insulin. However small it may spike insulin, whatever level it spikes it, it without exception causes a reactive hypoglycemia, which is a sugar crash um, as a result of sweeteners. So I would recommend to, to go against all sweeteners. And so we don't- Even you know, the low them. carb sweeteners? All of them, no all matter them. what, all of them. So uh, we don't support any sweetener whatsoever, be it natural, fake, whatever we don't mm. support them whether they're healthy or unhealthy otherwise that's another story we just simply don't support them because they cause a reactive hypoglycemia similarly uh we don't support for example for migraineurs who still have migraines and who uh so particularly if they're taking medications they should not be going for the ketogenic diet because the ketogenic diet causes first of all it offers a lot of fat, which is a lot of good fuel, but it doesn't offer uh, the properties of, of reducing the blood glucose variability for a migraineur. For other people, it's not a big deal if they're getting close to a sugar crash, but a migraineur getting close to a sugar crash causes a huge oh. electrolyte disturbance and they always end up with a migraine. And so, <clears throat> and also they really need to have a high protein diet because a higher protein, um, the excess protein, just I only count protein from animal products. I exclude them from plants because they're not really bioavailable. And so when they eat uh, animal product proteins, if they eat too much, then we know the excess is going to convert to glucose. But this glucose is not like you eat an apple. It's a slow conversion on by demand. And so um, this, kind of a glucose can <clears throat> help the migraineur maintain a state where she's not going to crash. And so we use more protein for a migraineur in order to prevent a sugar crash because they tend to crash. I mean, I have migraineurs who continuously crash. There's There are a couple of them, one in Finland, who crashes uh, regularly. I mean, during the night, she, uh, she's just so sick that she has to have continuously has to eat food and we check she doesn't have any kind of a disease that would be you know like the glycogen storage disease or anything no nothing like that it's just that she's so sensitive that uh she has to just pile on the meat has to eat a lot of protein and in time the body is going to settle and will heal and then that's going to be normalized and she will be able to go on the ketogenic diet but shouldn't start with that because wow. that is not going to provide enough nutrients to heal the body. It's just going to provide a lot of energy in terms of fat instead of sugar. Um, and the other problem that, the other thing that I would recommend for migraineurs is about the fasting. So a lot of nutritionists will go in and say, well, you should fast, uh, particularly if the person weighs a little heavier than should be, you should fast and it's going to, well, it actually doesn't work that way. Because one of the reasons the person is heavier than should be obvious is because of the insulin. And so if you have high insulin and you start fasting, the next thing that's going to happen is a sugar crash, which mm. again, for a migraineur is going to be a stronger sugar crash and it's more often. And because a migraineur is more sensitive, they can't really even experience a little bit of a sugar crash either without a migraine, without a, a major migraine. And so fasting is also not recommended at the beginning, but rather um, I recommend to eat more and more often, but only animal products. So the carnivore diet, mm, because mm. what I discovered, and this happened now over and over again, many times that um, we have our, our members eat a lot of calories, like of, of typical female and average height will have to eat around 1800 to 2000 calories. And if you're a little bit taller than even more, and what we find uh, is that more, most people end up eating over 2,000 calories, so much more than normal, but all animal products, and they end up losing weight, a lot of weight. They go to their normal body, even though they're eating much more in calories than they should be eating. But if they cut their calories, they start gaining weight. And so this is a very interesting phenomenon, which uh, I'm just 
about to give a Facebook mm. live on for, mm. for my group talking about because what is happening is that when your body is still not fully healed, it can't really, um, when your meta metabolic is still not fully there, your body can't really provide all the repair for your cells that you would need to have. And until you're not able to repair the cells, much of the energy that you're eating is going to be deposited for future use. But once your body is able to use the energy that you're taking in the protein to replace the cells, to optimize how they work, it will increase your metabolic speed and everything that goes along with it. You may be eating a lot of food, but all of it goes to replace damaged cells. And so mm. thereby your body is getting rid of all these inefficient damaged cells and your metabolic speed increases. So you will actually inc uh, reduce weight. So it's a very interesting phenomenon mm. that is happening. Yeah. And I don't know if this is just for migraineurs or not, but this is definitely sounds like it could be pretty, yeah, pretty uh, interesting for everybody. Um, so that's interesting. With the the more the higher protein, less lower lowering fat. So not really ketosis at the you know right. the beginning. No, no but, at all. Right. Okay. Then ketosis. And the fasting. Um, and then what about uh, electrolytes? As in these, you know, a lot of people take these electrolyte supplements that have potassium in them, magnesium and sodium. What's your view on those? Right, it's very bad. So uh, I'm glad that you brought up the magnesium. I forgot to mention that, that magnesium is an excitatory uh, substance for migraineurs. So if they take it at night, for example, they won't sleep. They'll be up oh. all night. It's going to be a buzzing brain with nightmares. So you don't want to have magnesium at night. It's function in the neuron is actually to open the little voltage gates. So it's going to be open, close, open, close, open, close. It's going to be oh up all night, gosh. driving you nuts. So whereas it puts people asleep, the migraineur, do that in the instead of a cup of coffee. Take your magnesium. So you don't want to have these electrolyte supplements. Basically, if you look at the only thing that you need as an electrolyte is salt. Because in your blood, the most electrolyte element, mineral, or actually these are all metals, the most is salt. And so when you transpire or talk and you lose moisture, you're only losing salt. You're not losing magnesium. You're not evaporating potassium. You're not evaporating calcium. You don't need to supplement all those. Just salt and water, nothing else. Table salt. And, and which, what, I was, that was, I, what did you say then? Just normal salt? Table salt. Table salt. Table salt. So that salt. was my next question because is there a special salt that people should be having? No, just actually the cheapest, simplest table salt with the least amount of preservatives. Don't take the Himalayan salt or Celtic salt or any of the fancy salts because those are evaporated salts. Or in the case of Himalayan, all the beautiful colors, those are like rust coming through as a result. And there's lead in it and it's even um, um, uh, radioactive. So you really don't want to take these salts. I mean, you can have it once in a while for a decorative meal. But when you take as much salt as we do, I take um, in sodium, we measure in the US sodium, I take over 10,000 uh, grams sodium a day. So that's like 40,000 milligrams salt a day. That's what I take a day. That's that's a lot. And so uh, that's like six, 10 times the RDA in salt. So when you're taking that much salt, you don't want to pile on the additives in the salt, and you certainly don't want to pile on the evaporated salt that are full of still what was in the sea. So think what's in the sea. There's a whole lot of bird poop, fish poop, organic matter from dead fish. These are the ones that give you the trace minerals. Hmm. If I want to, if I would drink a glass of water from the sea today, if I'm ready to do that, then I can take the evaporated salt. If I don't want to take a glass of water from the sea today because of all the fish poop and dead matter and whatever else, and even from ancient seas, it doesn't matter. They were flying and dropping their poops into the water. And there are fish who died in the water and all kinds of other sea elements, right? If you don't want to have all that gunk in your salt, then you need to have purified salt, the salt that was heated. And so, uh, so it's I'm, actually like a process, processed salt, really, but it's better. Processed, it's just heated. It's nothing mm -hmm. else. So if okay. you can buy like 
pickling salt, which doesn't have any additive added to it, no iodine, no additive, nothing, just pickling salt or canning salt. These are all just pure salt, but these are all heated. So not evaporated, but they've washed mm -hmm. off and they're heated. So all material that was organic on them is gone. Mm -hmm. So you don't have in them the lead and the mercury and the, the aluminum and the, all that kind of stuff in there. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Everyone, I think everyone's just like glued, <laughs> glued to your information as always. The other quick, the other quick um, question is just that interesting fact you said around how um, drinking salt um, and eating potassium. That is something I think is so you know poorly misunderstood, and I, I, I forget that too myself. But you know that the salt in water is very different. To when we put it on our food so sometimes particularly for a migrainer it's nowhere near and we don't want to be salting the food as so much drinking the salt and also for just other people as well if they have high blood pressure i have people in my migraine group who came in who are not migrainers with high blood pressure and um just adding the salt into the water instead of the food made the big difference big and difference. their blood pressure dropped because yeah. when you add it into the food, it goes inside the cell. And inside the cell, there is barely any salt. It's mostly mm -hmm. outside of the cell. And so once inside the cell, it's very difficult to get them out of there because they only go through voltage-gated channels. So you need to have the sodium and potassium moving in direction. And if you supplement potassium and it's in your blood, you need to have insulin and all kinds of other medications to take to push the potassium from the blood into the cells. I mean, it's a nightmare if you do them the wrong direction. Amazing, fascinating stuff. I could talk to you all day. I love, love, love talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and share your amazing knowledge with us today and for all the work you do, Angela. It's incredible. And please, you know, make sure you follow Angela. If you have migraines, please join her group. Um, you know, the information is just life changing. So thank you so, so much. Thank you for inviting me, Tracy. It's been a pleasure. Thank I'll you. See you again really soon. See you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.